I gave this lecture in Australia in 1986. I believe this lecture will help further clarify and set the framework of the women's struggle in a semi feudal and semi colonial society such as the Philippines. It has been fairly well established by anthropological evidence that women have had a very decisive role in bringing about civilization. In primitive society, the women who be who seem to have been dragged down by their natural function of pregnancy, childbirth, and child rearing, have been responsible for the development of settled life and with it the rudiments of agriculture and animal husbandry, for which they also had to develop a whole collateral series of techniques, including the storage and preservation of food. Thus, they developed handicraft, pottery, and the uses of fire. Even medicine and the rudiments of other sciences came to be developed by women. As primitive women labored collectively, they were also decisive in the development of language and speech. The priestesses who became the repository of the collective knowledge and skills of primitive community are said to have preceded their male counterparts. It was precisely the productive labor of women that initially relieved the men from the rigors of food gathering and enabled them to attend to other areas of human endeavor. From hunting, they began to develop warfare, secure territories, build larger communities, and move on to civilization. Mere division of labor between the sexes laid the basis and gave way to class divisions. With the development of civilization and the rise of exploitative societies, the women came to be relegated to a subordinate status even as they continued to be engaged in productive labor. Their contribution to productive labor as well as other endeavors came to be increasingly undervalued or even denigrated from the time of slave society through the feudal and on to capitalist society. Historical roots of women's oppression in the Philippines, as it has been the world over, the subordination and oppression of women in the Philippines came with the advent of class societies. Women oppression is principally a historical product of Spanish colonial and feudal domination, as well as of U.S. imperialist and semi-feudal or comprador landlord domination. This is not to say, however, that women would have had equal status with men had the Spanish colonialists and the U.S. imperialists not come to the Philippines. Pre-colonial societies on the archipelago had been in the process of rigidifying class stratification at the time of the coming of the Spanish colonizers in the 16th century. Pre-colonial societies in the archipelago ranged from primitive communal or tribal to semi-slave and semi-feudal. The majority of these communities were semi-slave with socio-economically integrated populations ranging from a few thousands up to 30,000 along rivers and coastlines. There were wet and dry rice agriculture and private ownership of wet rice lands. Handicrafts such as cloth and basket weaving, pottery, blacksmithing, and boat building were well developed in various parts of the archipelago. Coexisting with these more advanced societies were the hill tribes whose mode of production was still primitive. They were still largely food gatherers these tribes traded and interacted with the more advanced settled communities. In the majority of the pre-colonial riverine and coastal communities, classes had already emerged but had not yet rigidified. They were, there were the Datu families who owned slaves, wet rice lands, metal tools, animals, and boats. There was an intermediate class of free men who owned their own tools, wet rice lands, or kept their share of the produce from communally cultivated dry rice lands. Then there were the semi-slaves or serfs who served or paid tribute to the Datu families or the freemen. At the bottom of the economic ladder were the slaves who did not have a share of their produce but were sustained by their masters. Men and women labored collectively. There was no strict sex, sex differentiations in such economic activities as agriculture and fishing. Neither were there in their handicrafts. 
In cloth weaving, for example, some processes were done by men and boys. Even in blacksmithing, a few processes were done by women. Men and women had more or less equal status in the community. Women would become chieftains and held prestigious roles as priestesses. They had equal access to property and inheritance as the men. Marriage was contracted upon the mutual consent of the partners and was soluble upon the instance of either of them. There were no rigid concepts or practices that subordinated the women to the men. In areas where Islamic feudal practices had, however, taken roots and class stratification had developed or started to harden, the women had become dependent on the men. Slave trading was extensive. Polygamy and private property had been introduced. There existed a well-developed hierarchy or male political and religious leaders. Feudal patriarchal values had started to become entrenched. The coming of the Spanish colon colonizers instituted feudalism all over the archipelago and hastened the spread of feudal patriarchal culture, similar to that which had started to spread earlier by Muslim traders and settlers in some parts of the archipelago. Through more than 300 years of colonial rule, the Spaniards undertook a process of feudalizing the archipelago. This brought about the gradual and systematic lowering of the status of women relative to that of the men. The women were the first to be converted to the new religion, Roman Catholicism, that sought to bind them to domestic and parochial concerns. Religion played a key role in the propagation of the feudal patriarchal ideology. Ironically, it was the Indo Indio women whom the Spaniard, Spanish friars used to help them in propagating religion. Catechism and prayers became the main preoccupation of converted women. Beaterios or nunneries and colegios were set up to indoctrinate the daughters of the elite in the new religion. They became the new native purveyors of feudal patriarchal values. They were brainwashed into becoming tools of the friars and into accepting their lot as weak and inferior and naturally subjects of men within the fold of the feudal patriarchal family. Among the elite, women became alienated from any important independent economic role. Formal education was available, but aside from religious dogma, skills taught to them were limited to serving their men be they fathers, husbands, or friars. However, in agriculture, the peasant women could not be completely alienated from productive labor. With their men, they bore the yoke of feudal oppression. Women were, however, subjected to further servitude. More than sons, daughters were objects of debt patronage or forced menial service to the feudal lords and their families. Friar influence was not as pervasive among poor peasant women as it was among the women of the upper class. Male dominance was not as pronounced among the former. Spanish laws explicitly subordinated women to the men. Laws on pro property were definitely biased against women. For example, married women were deprived of the right to paraphernal property and prohibited from engaging in business without the husband's consent. Other laws prevented women from holding public office. It was only towards the latter part of the 19th century that women could be allowed to hold public office as teachers. Among the elite, the only other avenue open to women was the home of the nunnery. Towards the end of the 19th century, more than 300 years of Spanish colonial and feudal oppression and exploitation, the Filipino people rose up in revolution and succeeded in overthrowing their Spanish colonial masters. All throughout those 300 years, there were resistance to countless sporadic revolts against the Spanish colonialists until the final successful assault was the Philippine Revolution of 1896. Women took an increasingly active role in the resistance. In the Philippine Revolution of 1896, some women took a leadership role in the Katipunan, the organization that led the revolution. It had a women's section and members of the women's section directly participated in battles or led operations to seize arms from the enemy. These women consciously fought colonial oppression, but they were not yet consciously fighting to put an end to their subordinate status. U.S. imperialism came to frustrate the Philippine Revolution of 1896 by waging a war of aggression against the Filipino revolutionaries and the entire people. 
Although they had succeeded in overthrowing Spanish colonial power, the Filipino revolutionaries were not equipped ideologically, politically, and organizationally to confront a modern imperialist power that did only employ a vastly superior military force but also employed deceitful liberal rhetorics. With the defeat of the Filipino revolutionaries, U.S. monopoly capitalism superimposed itself on the feudal economy. A U.S.-dominated free trade involving the exchange of agricultural and other primary products from the Philippines and manufactured products from the United States was instituted, giving rise to a commodity economy on a feudal basis. A mercantile bourgeoisie rose to control the essentially commercial cities of the Philippines. It acted as the trading and financial agents of the foreign monopoly firms and the feudal lords who had monopoly of the lands on which primary exports were produced. The system allowed limited capitalist growth and the U.S. foreign investments flowed in to develop the mining industry, semi-processing or primary products like sugar and coconut and light manufacturing, a small local capitalist class arose. Industries put up by the U.S. and local capitalists enlarged the numbers of the working class that had emerged towards the end of the Spanish colonial regime. The further expansion of feudalism and the rise of semi-feudalism under the impetus of the expanded colonial pattern of trade between the U.S. and its Philippine semi-colony subjected women to further oppression and exploitation. A decadent Bourgeois culture was superimposed in the feudal patriarchal cultural legacy from more than 300 years of Spanish colonial rule. Medieval and pro-imperialist values became the two main factors in the Filipino cultural complex. The Filipino woman, who was subordinate to the man under the feudal patriarchal system, suffered further degradation in the process of commodification under the sway of U.S. monopoly capitalism. Women liberated from the parochial confines of the haciendas, the landlord's estate, became commodities in the capitalist labor market as well as in the sex trade and suffered economic discrimination. They were generally paid lower wages and had less opportunities for employment. Despite the supposed time of bourgeois democracy and expansion of educational opportunities for women, laws and practices discriminatory to them continued to be in force. The feudal patriarchal view of women as subordinates of men and domestic bound to care for home and family and the bourgeois decadent view of women as commodities for display with value dependent or desirability as male objects have combined to subject women to further discrimination in the economic sphere. The same views tell women to keep their peace and bear the woes of in silence. The National Democratic Revolution and the Women's Movement. We have seen from our historical review that the institutionalization and intensification of women's oppression in Philippine semi-colonial and semi-feudal society was the product of Spanish colonialism and U.S. imperialism. These forces brought about changes in the mode of production and in turn gave rise to the restructuring of society into ruling classes and ruled classes. From this, we have the ruling classes of compradors and landlords, the ruled classes of workers and peasants, and between them an intermediate class opposed, composed of professionals, small entrepreneurs, businessmen, and the intelligentsia. The ruled classes, the workers and peasants, comprise more than 90% of the population. The intermediate and middle classes, including the middle bourgeoisie, about 9%, and the ruling classes of compradors and landlords and their big bureaucrats agents would comprise the rest of the population. Women cut across all the above classes so that the overwhelming majority of them, more than 90 percent, belong to families of the oppressed and exploited classes of workers and peasants. As half of the entire Filipino nation, women suffer foreign domination and exploitation by U.S. imperialism. As half of the ruled classes, they suffer class oppression and exploitation by the comprador landlord classes. But apart from foreign and class exploitation and domination, women suffer male oppression and exploitation. This kind of domination, the women from the exploited and oppressed classes share with women of the exploiting classes. The overwhelming majority of Filipino women therefore suffer three layers of oppression, U.S. imperialist domination or national oppression, comprador landlord class oppression and exploitation and male domination, shared fate 
with the women of the exploiting classes. The National Democratic Revolution addresses the national question by fighting for national freedom and against foreign domination by the U.S. in the political, economic, military, and cultural spheres. At the same time, it addresses the class question by putting forward a program of genuine land reform and national industrialization to liberate the peasant masses economically and politically. The economic and social liberation of the peasant masses is the main democratic content of the revolution. The organized forces of the National Democratic Revolution pay special attention to organizing women and enlarging their participation in the entire people's struggle for national freedom and democracy. As members of the Filipino nation and as members of the exploited classes, women involve themselves in that struggle because the subjection of women is an outgrowth of foreign and feudal domination. The struggle for women's rights is interconnected with the struggle for national freedom and democracy. Women liberate themselves from oppression and rise to a level of equality with men by participating actively in the struggle to overthrow foreign and feudal domination. Though their through their participation, they develop the distinct strength and ability to undo the most deeply rooted prejudices against women, <clears throat> not only among the men, but also among their own ranks. It is in this struggle that the women acquire a sense of their own power and develop their potential. Women's liberation is not the exclusive preserve of women and is not being pursued outside of the National Democratic Revolution. It is an overriding concern of the entire revolutionary movement, while women's movement is aimed at securing specific rights and welfare of women within the revolutionary movement and outside the women's movement, is primarily aimed at overthrowing the material basis of women's oppression, which in particular circumstances of the Philippines are U.S. imperialism and feudalism. There is another dimension to the women's liberation movement borne by the fact that male domination cuts across all social classes. The issue of women's rights and equality has the potential of, un of uniting women from all classes in a struggle to strike at the roots of socio-economic system that has nurtured male dominance. This potential, however, should not obscure the necessity of grasping the class line in the women's liberation movement. We must recognize that it is among women of the exploiting classes that the schizophrenic culture of Philippine semi-colonial and semi-feudal society is most entrenched. As part of the National Democratic Movement, the women's movement in the Philippines is a proletarian core. This core is built from among the most advanced elements of the working class and working class women. Building the proletarian core of the women's movement is a task not only of women in the revolutionary movement, but of the entirety of the movement. This is in recognition of the fact that the proletariat is the leading class in the National Democratic Revolution and subsequently in the future struggle to establish a truly egalitarian and democratic society that would ensure peace, prosperity, and progress for all its members. The proletarian core builds the basic alliance of the working class women and women of the peasantry. Further on, it adds to the basic alliance the women of the middle classes to form part of the basic forces of the National Democratic Revolution representing the objective interests of the entire people, including those of 90% the, of, of the women. Organizing and mobilizing the peasant women is a task of great significance, not only to the women's movement, but also to the entire national democratic movement. The vast majority of women are peasants. They constitute about 75% of the women in the country. In turn, the majority of peasant women belong to the poor and middle strata of the peasantry. The focus of organization and mobilization is in these strata. Organizers, including men, have persevered in organizing, educating, and mobilizing peasant women from barrio to barrio. Organizations that have been formed have contributed immensely to the advance of the national democratic cause. Peasant women have developed themselves into a political force from the barrio level upwards. They undertake educational and organizational campaigns to build their organizations. They put forward their stand on issues and ensure that women are well represented in the people's organizations. They fight for the democratic rights of women and at the same time seek to do away with unreasonable customs, laws, and other conditions prejudicial to them. Peasant women's organizations work closely with peasant organizations in demanding and carrying out genuine land reform, as well as in raising agricultural production. 
They also set up health, welfare, and cultural projects. Their organizations stand up against military forces in the countryside and the atrocities and abuses of the military. Organized peasant women have been very effective in exposing and opposing the fascist campaigns of terror, both under the Marcos regime and the new regime that has put a stop, that has not put a stop to these campaigns, but instead continued to intensify these campaigns. The second largest group of women come from the working class or of working class families. They constitute about 15% of the women. They too are being organized and mobilized to address their problems in their communities, to address specific women's issues confronting them, and to participate in the overall struggle of the people. Women from the middle classes constitute some 9% of, of the total women population, but they are very a very significant part of the National Democratic Movement and the Women's Liberation Movement. They are highly literate and articulate, and they have played a very important role in setting up a nationwide network of women's organization. They have linked themselves to the women who belong to the toiling masses to add their strength to them. Women have become a powerful force for revolutionary change. As the National Democratic Movement progresses, more and more women will be involved. By participating and contributing to the victory of the movement, they create the basic conditions for their full emancipation and greater contribution to social development. But the end of foreign and feudal domination will not automatically result in women's full equality with men. Deep-seated prejudices against women will still tend to be nurtured by backward elements of society. However, the biggest obstacles to women's liberation and equality with men are removed and the women can vigorously fight for their rights in the continuing struggle for the social transformation of our society into one that is truly independent, democratic, just, progressive, prosperous, and peaceful. Now I will answer questions sent in in advance by content. Who were the key figures in the Filipino Women's Emancipation Revolution and what role did they play in the movement? Maria Lorena Barros led in setting up Makibaka together with women's mass activists produced by the Women's Bureau. Kabataang Makabayan encouraged women youth activists to join the National Democratic Movement so that as soon as it was founded, it immediately created a Women's Bureau and Lorena was among those early women recruits to the National Democratic Movement, which led her to initiate the organization of Makibaka. Gabriela was also set up later in the 1980s, an alliance of women's organization in the legal democratic mass movement. I delivered Joma's keynote message in the founding as he was still in detention at that time. Question number two. What were some of the key achievements of the Filipino women's emancipation and how have these achievements continued to shape Filipino society today? The women's emancipation movement has become a mainstream movement in the Philippines. It has relations with women's organizations of all types all over the world. It promotes the policy of the broad united front in both its relations domestically and internationally. Issue-based cooperation are promoted and developed. The most prominent women's organization worldwide is the International Women's Alliance, which was founded in 2010. It is a global alliance of grassroots-based women's organizations, institutions, alliances, networks, and individuals united in establishing a democratic, anti-imperialist, progressive women's movement in the 21st century. It aspires for a society that recognizes, promotes, and protects the rights and interests of women and is void of all forms of discrimination and violence against women. It also strives to intensify local struggles and campaigns against imperialism and capitalism, strengthen international solidarity, and contribute to the people's struggle for national liberation, sovereignty, and self-determination. Third question. How did Jose Maria Sison's writings and the national democratic ideology influence the goals and strategies of the Filipino women's emancipation movement? The issue of women's emancipation has always been important to Joma. To him, as to the great Mao Zedong, women hold up half of the sky. Their participation in the revolution is essential for its victory. Joma wrote articles and speeches that have greatly influenced the policy and practice of women's organizations in the Philippines and abroad. In his address to the First National Congress of Makibaka, he wrote that, in a semi-feudal and semi-colonial society like the Philippines, it is inevitable that women like men suffer from the three systems of authority, such as political, 
clan and religious. In addition, however, women suffer from the authority of the husband or what we may call male authority. These four authorities that women have to contend with can easily be seen as expression of feudal patriarchal ideology and system. Though in urban areas there seems to be a blatant train of bourgeois ideas and values perceived in their most decadent forms as bred by cultural imperialism, the feudal patriarchal ideology and system persists in a countrywide base for prejudices against women. Decades of modern imperialist culture lay over centuries of feudal patriarchalism in our history. Extremely, it is extremely important for the women's liberation movement to grasp the line that political authority is the backbone of all other systems of authority. By overturning that authority, we begin to overturn all other systems. Political struggle participating vigorously in the National Democratic Movement now is therefore the key link to the great cause of women's liberation. The women's liberation movement is basically a political struggle with a revolutionary class character. The political authority of foreign imperialism, domestic feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism must be overthrown if Filipino women are to be liberated and achieve equality of the sexes. End of quote. Fourth question. How did the national democratic approach to women's emancipation compare with and contrast with other prominent figures and movements in the country? The national democratic approach to women's emancipation is all round or comprehensive. It is not merely a struggle against patriarchy, it is a struggle for equality in all aspects of life, in the workspace, in the home, and in the revolutionary struggle. The revolutionary struggle has produced countless women, cadres, and leaders. Fifth question. What is the role and value of armed struggle in the emancipation of Filipino women? It is in the class struggle that women cultivate and realize their capabilities. It is in winning the National Democratic Revolution that the major obstacles are removed. And they can continue to remove the remaining obstacles left by centuries of old habits, customs, and institutions in a new society that actively combats all this. But the women's movement need to be, need be there to realize this. Sixth question, why is it important to uphold human rights in the context of armed emancipatory struggles? Human rights or people's rights is the back bedrock upon which the women, the people struggle for emancipation from all oppressive system is anchored. Individual and class freedom must be asserted by the oppressed, no matter the guarantees in bourgeois constitution that this, this is never realized unless asserted by the oppressed. Needless to say, the revolutionary forces uphold human rights in both the conduct of the civil war and its relations with the masses of the oppressed people. Seventh and last question, how can we continue to engage with and build upon the national democratic movement work on women's emancipation in the Philippines and beyond. We can do this by expanding and consolidating the existing women's ND organizations and building new ones so as to lead the revolution to victory. Thank you.